Who let the dogs out? I love dogs. I love dogs, too. Glad we're all on the same page. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Sarah Andreco Show. Dr. Scott Campbell, a board-certified veterinary nutritionist, is joining us today out of Brisbane, Australia, to talk about the nutrition behind homemade diets. Now, homemade diets can be so much more complicated and really individualized more than people think. And if appropriate nutritional needs and requirements aren't met for pets, then there can be some pretty tragic results to that, not just medically, but also behaviorally. So without further ado, Dr. Scott, thanks so much for joining us today and lending us your time and expertise. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, it's uh, it's lovely to talk to you. And I, I think it's a, a, a an interesting topic for a lot of people. There seems to be a a subset of people that like having that connection uh, of preparing food for their pet and uh, uh, they, they see it as more wholesome. So it's, uh, it's certainly a topic worth chatting about. Yes, thanks. Um, it does seem to be a bit of a, a, a diet trend and I always get nervous about diet trends because, you know, especially with the last one that came through with grain-free diets, a lot of different foods made it to market before they were probably really ready to do so. And so I could see this as being a really good thing or a really bad thing, depending on which way that it goes kind of, you know, what are your thoughts about whether it's a good idea or a bad idea that people are starting to look into kind of more individualized diets, uh, kind of taking that into their own hands? Uh, well, I think um, being in Australia, we, we seem to be a little bit uh, less uh, erratic with the trends. I, I think it, it's always been an undercurrent here. There's always been a subset of people that like to home prepare food. Um, and so we don't probably have the big swings uh, that I saw when I was working in the States where uh, there, does, there do seem to be those really distinct trends or fashions uh, that move through the industry. Uh, I agree. I think there's, um, with, with each feeding approach, there tends to be uh, benefits and uh, potential risks. And I think any time we look at making a change, it probably uh, plays well to think through both sides of that uh, equation. Uh, where we tend to run into trouble is uh, where we have a very polarised um, thought process or discussion where uh, only the positives or only the negatives are discussed. And uh, certainly with home-prepared diets, I think there's uh, a number of things on both sides of that ledger that need to be taken into account. What do you think some of the most important considerations are if someone's deciding to start their, their dog on a homemade diet or cat for that matter? Yeah, I, I think, um, first of all, the, the question would be why um, and go back to that thought process of, um, you know, what why they're desiring to do it. Because there are, uh, I think, individual animals out there in the population that um, can't find a commercially available diet that actually meets their needs. Uh, and so for those guys, we might have no choice um, but to uh, to do it. Uh, if it's a, a bit more of a philosophical uh, desire, then uh, I guess, you know, we go back to where that comes from and, and whether it's really needed. Um, home prepared diets are always more time consuming. Um, there's a reason that commercial diets uh, came to exist to begin with. Um, and, you know, they're, they're an easier alternative. Um, they're a faster alternative and they tend to be a cheaper alternative uh, and if we follow those um, sort of WSAVA guidelines on how to choose a commercial food uh, we're likely to choose one that's been through appropriate testing that so that we know that it's from a, a reputable manufacturer and it's going to be pretty safe uh, for the most part right so we can mitigate some risks uh, around it as well uh, when we're going to choose a home prepared diets we have to do some more of that uh, intellectual work ourselves um, and so, you know, the, the biggest uh, mistake I see people making is, is probably oversimplifying it, um, not feeding a diet that ends up being complete and balanced in the long term. And of course, in the short term, that's fine. As long as you're getting the calories in, uh, as long as it's flavoursome, the pets are pretty happy. They're not going to tell you that it's unbalanced. Um, but, you know, it, that, that's a problem that we have to recognise um, and hopefully before it causes clinical problems. And are, are there some common mistakes that you see routinely with people that are, um, you know, going on Pinterest or Google and creating their own homemade diets as far as deficiencies are concerned or a lack of specific ingredients? I know um, someone had mentioned to me one time, another veterinarian that's over here in the States, that their concern was a high fat content and how that was negatively affecting um, a number of dogs that were on homemade diets. Do you see any of those common mistakes like that? Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I've looked... 
over time in Australia and in the States, and I've had a few international clients from elsewhere as well, but I've looked at a lot of different recipes over time. And I'm yet to find one that's been complete and balanced when it came down to the, uh, the crunch. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of common deficiencies, and then you're right, there are a lot of common excesses that you can run into trouble with as well. Um, you know, certainly with home-prepared diets, we see probably a greater percentage, and, you know, I, I don't have hard data to back this up, but certainly my impression would be that we see a greater percentage of dogs with pancreatitis uh, or gastroenteritis um, from, you know, those changes in the nutrient profile uh, you know, insensitivities that maybe haven't been recognised on commercial diets. Um, but, you know, scarier for me, I think, are the deficiencies, um, you know, because often uh, things as simple as calcium deficiency are fairly common, or, you know, really common when you're looking at people's um, recipes that they've made themselves or they've found online or in texts. Um, they tend to be uh, often deficient in calcium. And, you know, the first sign that you might see uh, with that is, is, is fractures, pathologic fractures. And so when, you know, the very first inclination you get is when an animal's got a, a fractured leg or spine, it, it, it's, it's a fairly terrifying sequelae to arrive at. Uh, yeah, B vitamin deficiencies, choline deficiencies, uh, sometimes fat deficiencies, they can be the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know, gee, you see everything. It really, really is a whole range, uh, a raft of different uh, diet approaches out there, you know, from people feeding uh, only uh, raw meat or cooked meat right through to people feeding only vegetarian or vegan diets. And so the spectrum is so large, it's hard to make a, a single comment that captures all of that. Of course. Um, well, when it comes to meeting all of those nutritional needs and avoiding some of those deficiencies, when you are formulating diets, individual diets for dogs, I know there's a lot that goes into it. So I'm really curious to hear about some of the background information that you collect and how you kind of formulate those diets, but are there, um, specific supplements or probiotics or things that you kind of, you have in your kind of go-to toolkit to add to the proteins and the grains and the vegetables to make sure that they're getting everything that they need and they aren't deficient in a particular mineral? Or do you tend to lean on all of the ingredients that are in the diet as opposed to supplementation for them? Um, where possible, I try and use ingredients from the diet. Um, but I'll, I'll go through the process uh, or my thought process, if you, if you like. It, it probably goes back a couple of steps from uh, where we're kicking in. I, I think, you know, I, I think I look around the process of what the owner's got available to them, um, you know, as far as financial resources, their own time resources. Um, I, I look at, um, you know, where they live, what ingredients they can actually uh, obtain readily and predictably. It has to, you know, not just be seasonally available or has to be able to be stored if it is seasonally available. And then I look at the animal and I think about all of their specific needs as well. You know, what are their caloric needs? Um, going back to that, and, you know, while we can uh, give an average for a dog of that weight, if we can get prior diet information and what it's been eating when it's been weight stable, we might be able to be even more accurate with uh, the calorie contents or daily calorie intake that we're going to set. Uh, and then I'll look at what ingredients are uh, tolerated or not tolerated by that individual animal. Um, and then I'll look at, you know, what nutrient profile we're trying to achieve. Um, and for the most part, uh, I tend to deal with animals that have uh, one or more uh, disease states. So they have really specific uh, nutrient profiles that we're trying to achieve. And so all of that thought process goes in before well, we actually sit down in front of a computer um, and then try and formulate out a diet. Uh, and then we'll try and tweak the ingredients to give not only the macronutrient profile, but some of the micronutrients uh, that we're trying to add into the diet. And then when we've taken that as far as we can, that's when we start looking to supplements. Uh, and a lot of the time when we're using supplements, we're trying to reach for some sort of uh, considered optimal range. Um, you know, it, it may be even tighter than uh, the NRC or AFCO have for their guidelines. Uh, we're trying to think about that individual, what's, what's known to be safe for that individual, what can we allow for maybe differences in digestion or absorption and assimilation of the nutrient to make sure we get the correct amount into the animal. Uh, so we'll fine tune it sometimes beyond uh, published um, recommendations. Um, and then once we've do done all that, <laughs> then we have to make sure the owner can collate all that information and get all the ingredients together 
we have to produce it um, in sufficient quantities to be able to provide for the animal and we have to make sure that it's either blended or mixed thoroughly enough that the animal doesn't selectively out, eat out ingredients that it prefers. Uh, otherwise, the recipe is useless. Um, and then we also have to, I guess, take on board an element of risk that we don't have to take with us on quite a few commercial diets and that none of the home prepared diet recipes that we come up in come up with individually for animals have been through feeding trials uh, to ensure that they are palatable and tolerated and digestible um, such that the nutrients get into the animal so you know there's there's always that um, uh, stressor that plays in the back of my mind regardless of how much consideration we give it um, we honestly don't know whether it's going to be uh, a perfect combination or, or or something that's uh, full short. Um, and so that, you know, even, even with all the, the work on earth, unless it's been through a feeding trial, unless it's been proven to be effective for a bunch of animals, uh, that, that worry resides um, around diet recipes. So do you have any sort of monitoring system that you use at any given point in time to decide whether the diet that you formulated for a specific, a specific pet is, is doing what you want it to do or that they're actually... Yeah. Um, benefiting fully from the diet yeah. that you're trying to formulate for that specific animal yeah absolutely so you know in the short term we we can get the owner to check for acceptance of the diet um whether they have any gastrointestinal upsets before you know uh, as that diet's introduced um and then you know it depends a little bit on the the animal's condition as well often we'll be looking for improvement in a clinical condition um, and then we do generally uh, advise closer monitoring of these animals, um, you know, depending on the nutrient profiles we've come up with. But maybe we'll do blood testing a little bit more regularly uh, than we would otherwise. Maybe we might do radiographs to check um, bone density uh, a little bit more regularly. Um, so, you know, that, that those ongoing parameters um, will depend a little bit on the diet profile, will depend a little bit on the animal's um, specific disease states, conditions, I guess. Gotcha. Um, so another question I have too is about nutritional availability because um, one of the things that I learned from a, a friend of mine that's um, also a vet nutritionist over here in the States is that, um, and this is you know the same for people when they're digesting food too, based on how you cook it, at what temperature. So basically the method you cook it, at what temperature you cook it, if you're cooking it with other items, uh, different ingredients have different nutritional availabilities. So with your formulated diets, do you typically have people, um, do you give them advice about how to cook each individual ingredient? Are some of the ingredients cooked together? Is it a crock pot kind of style um, as far as preparing food is concerned? Or how does that typically work out to get the most out of the, the food? Uh, so generally we'll uh, use information from the USDA uh, nutrient database, um, the National Agricultural Library. You can go on, uh, it's a, a free resource that you can find online. Uh, 20,000 different diet uh, ingredients last I looked, and it's a human resource. And so they have uh, specific cuts of meat or, you know, types of cheese or whatever. And they'll also have different preparation styles um, and uh, trimming styles and all the rest that are, that are built into that. Um, there are ingredients that we use for animals that aren't in that um, system and they've had to be uh, assessed individually. Um, certainly we've had to do nutrient profiles on uh, kangaroo meat and everything when we can't find that within the USDA nutrient database. And so you do end up having to uh, sometimes assess uh, specific ingredients to find out what you want to use. Um, you're dead right in that there's variation within that as well. There's going to be seasonal variation, geographic variation uh, within specific ingredients. And, you know, certainly for us in Australia, using a US resource, uh, our um, nutrient profiles of specific ingredients might be quite vastly different. So we try and use uh, local resources, uh, similar databases within Australia. Uh, and it, it is uh, exactly why when we are formulating, we, we don't just formulate to meet minimum requirements. We'll, we'll try and aim for something a little bit higher than that, uh, as long as we're not getting into any potentially toxic ranges, um, just to allow for those uh, variations. Um, you know, we, we like to believe that they're subtle changes, but they might not be. You, you know, big companies deal with that by assessing um, you know, individual loads of ingredients when they come through. They'll assess each one for nutrient profile, for the presence or absence of different toxins. 
um, they'll end test uh, their product to make sure it has the nutrient profile that is, uh, you know, promised from uh, before. And certainly from a home cook perspective, when we're talking about much smaller volumes, we just we just don't have that availability. We just can't do that sort of testing. Yeah. So, I mean, I think to further your point there, you can purchase, you know, say you're purchasing a specific ingredient for the diet that's formulated for your dog or cat from, you know, a local farm or a local store, the, the, the resource or the source where that, that crop is from, or that meat is provided from the farm that the meat is coming from might be different the next time around. And that might have a different nutritional profile. So it can, it can tend to vary greatly from what you're saying, if I, if I'm understanding correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. It can have a very, quite a different nutrient profile and it can have, uh, you know, presence or absence of different bacteria or toxins. And, and so all of that plays into the variation that we see. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's always uh, one of the outs, I guess, when, when you see people that have been feeding home prepared diets and their animals had an issue with it, it's then hard to say, well, that's an issue with that particular line of diets because there's such a, you know, variation in what people uh, do within that realm. Um, it, it's one of the big reasons I try and stay away from pre-made recipes uh, on the internet or whatever. Um, you know, the fine tuning matters, I think, um, you know, and, and science is moving on constantly. So what was a perfect recipe five years ago uh, might not be considered that, that anymore. You know, I mean, we, we're finding out information about the nutrient bioavailability of uh, different minerals depending on what they're uh, linked to. So, you know, a lot of that uh, information is is coming to hand, is being developed at the moment. So, you know, it is genuinely an emerging uh, topic. Yeah, and it's really interesting too. You, you had mentioned before about um, kibble. You know, obviously kibble came about because of convenience and if you can source these ingredients in mass amounts and you can process them through a factory in mass amounts, obviously you can reduce costs as well. So reduction of cost, and then obviously the convenience of just popping some food in a bowl. And now that people are kind of moving in more of a direction where, you know, we, we recognize more than animals are sentient beings. We're trying to change your diet. We're trying to, you know, treat them more like members of our family, as opposed to the guard dog out back or the working dog on the farm. Um, and so uh, when it comes to, you know, sourcing these different ingredients for animals and the availability to them, um, I think it's really important to hone in on that individualism that you were talking about. And we, when we look, we're looking at kibble for convenience versus a fresh diet that you have to cook and prepare and ingredients might be more expensive. Um, I, I would like to um, just kind of... Uh, Put some emphasis around the fact that it's not as simple as it may seem. So to your point about Googling recipes and things like that, it's really important to have somebody that knows what they're doing, an expert in the field that can help you kind of um, formulate those diets specifically to the needs of the individual dogs. Um, and, and the reason I'm thinking of this even more so is because of all these different things that we've bred all these different dogs for, I imagine that it varies greatly from, you know, based on breed, based on sex, based on age, disease process, food intolerances, you know, things that are genetically linked, um, and animals and how that plays a role in their dietary needs. But do you see anything in particular that is linked to things like breed and sex and age um, that heavily influence? Like, you, your, your mind moves so fast there. It's incredible. <laughs> and you, you've hit like 16 fantastic topics Sorry. there, all of which I have an opinion on. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think coming back to it, you're, you're right. You know, if we go back to when commercial diets uh, came into being, it was at a time where we thought about dogs and cats entirely differently. Uh, you know, they, they had to earn their keep. They're often working animals, uh, offering protection or, you know, working on properties and things. And, and so, and, and a lot of those dogs were functional until they ran into uh, old age. And then really, they weren't particularly um, fondly kept beyond that. Not all of them. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities. But, you know, I, I think... You know, our, our desire for what we want from our pets um, and our expectations of ourselves have moved really dramatically. You know, Mother Nature can be a really hard beastie. You know, she doesn't mind a little bit of suffering. And so, you know, Mother Nature was very happy for uh, our dogs who lived until they were five or six years, produce a couple of healthy litters and offspring that then, you know, the genetics had passed through. And then Mother Nature was quite happy to have them suffer and die and get out of the way and free up resources for that younger generation. Now, that's that's the natural process in a way. Now, what we're doing is thinking beyond that and trying to 
reach for something that is entirely unnatural, really. We're trying to keep our animals and ourselves alive for much longer than possibly we're meant to. You know, we're trying to keep them healthy and happy and engaged yeah. uh, beyond what Mother Nature really probably set them out to be. And we have to think beyond uh, a natural diet in order to do that. Uh, a natural diet supplies, you know, supplied adequate calories, uh, you know, hopefully adequate protein and all the rest to keep them alive for short term. But we weren't thinking about long term deficiency. We weren't thinking about risk of ox oxidative stress causing a higher risk of cancer in 10 years. You know, these, these are considerations that are really modern considerations with the idea that we're trying to aim for something, something far beyond a natural lifespan where, you know, a, a natural outcome. Um, and, and, you know, that requires thinking, uh, modern thinking, I guess, thinking beyond, um, you know, the basics, the simplicity. Um, we, we seem to have this uh, concept, uh, this, this ball back at times that we should be feeding uh, animals more like uh, human beings. And, you know, human being nutrition uh, is pretty crap, to be, to be really frank. You know, we've got hundreds of millions of people that are uh, protein deficient, iodine deficient, um, you know, we've got uh, iron deficient. We, we, we've got people that are unhealthy because of obesity. We've still got people starving in the world. Uh, to hold up human nutrition as some sort of gold standard that we should be trying to achieve is really, uh, frankly, quite laughable. So, you know, if we, if we think about uh, the optimising of human nutrition, where, where it really comes into its own, I'd be thinking about sometimes the, the military applications where they're trying to have soldiers be fit and healthy for extended periods of time, mentally agile, all the things that are important there, uh, or our athletes, you know, where they have dietitians working with them uh, to make sure they're getting optimal nutritional support uh, to achieve uh, physically uh, at, their, at their highest level. And, you know, for those folks, it, it takes a lot more consideration. Their meals are far more tightly considered and restricted um, so that they're getting adequate uh, not only adequate calories and protein, those macronutrients, but each of their micronutrients has been considered in incredible detail. And so what I don't want to see, uh, what my greatest fear is with, with uh, animal nutrition, is that we go from feeding scraps uh, to wild animals and domesticating them to feeding something that was complete and balanced and designed to be safe and healthy and to optimise their lifespan. And certainly a lot of the, the bigger manufacturers are um, resistant resistant to say better manufacturers, but bigger, more progressive manufacturers have moved to thinking about specific life stages, specific breeds, you know, specific conditions where they have diets that are nuanced to be ideal for that um, or as close as they can consider for a group um, to be ideal for that individual. You know, I don't want to move from that complexity which allows us to choose diets that match the animal's needs so much more closely back to feeding scraps and unbalanced diets. Uh, that is genuinely a step backwards, uh, despite the well-intentioned uh, desires of a lot of owners. You know, and, and even the people advising on some of these uh, broad diet recipes, I, I honestly think their intentions are good. I think these are good people trying to do the right thing, uh, thinking of only the positives, maybe not thinking about some of the complexity. Um, but, you know, good intentions doesn't get us away from problems. And so we, we, we do have to think, you know, what are we trying to achieve? How do we get all of the benefits, um, you know, that might be there with feeding a fresh, wholesome, um, homemade, home-prepared diet? Maybe it might be more palatable. It might be more digestible. It might have a specific nutrient profile. We can get all of those benefits. But how can we do that while mitigating the risk? How, how can we do that while reducing uh, the risk of nutrient deficiency, um, of selective eating or whatever that, that are going to result in bigger problems. Because, you know, I, I don't want to improve the palatability, the digestibility at the risk of having a dog uh, with a broken leg or skin conditions or blindness or a thousand other things that can be caused by nutrient problems. So um, it, it does take and you have to embrace the complexity. If you're looking for simplicity, I think the risk is always going to be to go back to something that um, involves greater risk than where we started from. So yeah. I, I don't know if I answered the question you asked, but this is, that, that's all the stuff that was mulling around in my mind as you were talking. <laughs> my many questions. Sorry about that. I threw like six of them at you at once. Um, but you, well, you I'm, bring I'm up a very male brain, mate. I'm afraid. So I'm, I'm good for remembering about one at a time. I think beyond that, I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay. 
I've got six conversations going on in my head at once. That's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. It, yeah. I mean, it's, it's obvious that you're interested and enthusiastic in the, in the topic. And I like that. Yeah, well, believe it or not, it's one of the top questions that I put in my behavior questionnaire as a behavior consultant, because I think that diet plays such a big role in a dog's overall behavior and well-being. You've got that direct connection to the brain, to the gut from the blood brain barrier. And if the nutrition is off, the dog is off. And I feel people are the same way. Um, mm -hmm. Where I, I tend to see people failing when it comes to homemade diets is kind of what you mentioned before about that anthropomorphism. You know, we, we, we're like, oh, we can eat this. It's good for our dogs. If I can mm -hmm. formulate my own diets, I can form formulate my dog's diets. But mm -hmm. your dog has different nutritional needs than you do. And not yeah, just in a general different. sense. Yeah. yeah, but in an individual sense too. A lot of it comes too. back to our, you know, how we evolved. Um, you know, we evolved very differently and our outcomes are very different. Our lifespans are very different. Our, our, you know, biochemical pathways, our physiologic pathways are all vastly, vastly different. And, and you're right. I, I see that too. I see people feeding their dog like themselves and thinking that's the way to go. Um, and yet it, it, it fails more often than, than we desire, I suppose. Again, yeah. well, well and that, Oh, yeah. I feel like people that are that are trying to do the right, that, that's where it's coming from. It's coming from a very good place where these dogs yeah. are a part of the family and they want to do what's best for them. They're just not educated enough on the topic and they don't understand how complex it is. I mean, the other thing I've seen too, is where too many people are comparing domesticated dogs to wolves, you know, and yeah. what you mentioned before about lifespan, wolves aren't meant to yeah. live as long as a domesticated dog is, and their diet is not meant to be the same. You know, we've yeah. seen this like omnivorous shift and please feel free to correct me at any point if I'm wrong, but this more yeah. omnivorous shift in the way that, um, domesticated canines eat versus, yeah. you know, a wolf. In particular yeah and i i do get quite a giggle out of that sometimes because i, I see the same thing i know what you're saying um <laughs> look I, I think you know we we've put incredible selection pressure on on dogs in particular you know and uh the breeds that we have if you think that you can launch them out into mother nature and have them survive longer than a couple of weeks i, I think you're kidding yourself <laughs> um, many of them, many of them don't survive outside the owner's arms or off the lounge room chair so I, I think we have to be aware that, you know, in doing that and in getting those particular physical, um, physiologic um, changes that we desire, behavioural um, characteristics that specific breeds have, you know, we, we, we've increased the selection pressure in, in really unnatural ways. Uh, and in doing so, you, you're right, we've altered the, their nutritional needs along with it, uh, unintentionally a lot of the time, um, you know, it, it, it's we've made dramatic changes and so it, it it is certainly fluid logic at the very basic level to uh, to think that we can feed them an entirely natural diet and I, i've already spoken about some of the the risks of thinking about that thinking about a natural um diet if you're going to feed a natural diet then you have to accept natural consequences which might be periodic gastroenteritis broken teeth um you know intestinal blockages and an early death they're all very natural uh, undesirable horribly undesirable things, but very natural. Yeah. I don't think people are quite prepared for that outcome. <laughs> it's no, well, it's, you know, there's vastly, there's a, there's a vast amount of information coming out now in human nutrition, talking about how it can impact, um, you know, a lot of uh, people's psychology, you know, a lot of their physiology, biochemistry at very basic levels is altered and, and you know, understandably so. Um, and so I think we'll come to a, uh, a greater understanding of how we can modulate uh, diet over the next decade. Uh, I think there'll be watershed moments through that. Um, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we, we've learned a lot, but there's a lot more to learn. And, you know, I, I think we have to continue to be open-minded about that. Um, but I think the, the risk with moving uh, too fast with the paucity of information is that we go backwards rather than forwards. Um, and that's always my consideration. So, you know, there are animals that I, I try not to um, uh, feed home prepared diets to uh, if they're particularly high risk of, I think there are risks around that individual with, with feeding a home prepared diet, I'll try and counsel an owner away from it. Um, ultimately, I'm in the, the risk minimization game, right? I'm, I'm, I'm educating people where I can, where they want to listen and I'm open to their information and education as well. I'm not closed minded in that regard. And ultimately we'll find a plan that um, hopefully works well for those pets and then we'll monitor afterwards and make sure we get a desired outcome. Um, that, that's a vet's job. Um, so I'm going to help them wherever I can. But, 
Uh, it has to be an open discussion both ways. And I've certainly had people come into me on home prepared diets. Um, I've counseled them away from it. They've started a commercial diet and the animal's been much healthier and happier afterwards. Um, I think the risk we make with saying that there's only one approach that works is flawed. Um, there are animals, there are genuinely animals that need a home prepared diet to do well. There are genuinely animals that will do better on a commercial diet than a home prepared diet. And so I think, you know, we have to be very open minded. If, if we want to uh, feed a, a vegan diet, a lot of that comes back to a thought even in, in pet selection. No, uh, dogs may do well with it, but not every dog will do well with it. Uh, if we want a vegan animal, then maybe we do have to think about pet selection. Maybe we should have got a, uh, a goat. You know, goats are wonderful pets. Uh, or a pet <laughs> or a rabbit or, you know, a, a thousand other options that could work and make that decision, uh, that holistic uh, phil philosophical decision um, easier. So, I, I you know, I, I, I think... Yeah, I don't want philosophy to drive the discussion beyond uh, what's healthy for the individual pet. And ultimately, health, I think, uh, has to come first. Yeah, I, th I think you hit something there. And that requires a level deeper of thinking when it comes to being a responsible pet owner, period. So if, if you're if you have philosophical differences with feeding, you know, meat to other animals, because you don't believe it's right to ingest meat yourself, you know, you're not going to go out and purchase a snake or, you know, you're, yeah, but you yeah. have to understand that the animal you have may have different nutritional requirements. So I, I really like that point that you bring up about maybe potentially choose a different, a different pet, you know, choose a vegetarian pet if you're, you know, if you feel very deeply that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think so. um, and, you know, we, we, we all have to be open minded in the discussion. Some of the best discussions I have uh, are people that have uh, philosophically incredibly different views to mine. And, and that's wonderful. You know, I, I embrace that because I'm going to learn something. They're going to learn something. Maybe if we can find a middle way through it all. Um, uh, you know, the, the worst possible outcome is that we ignore each other and go in different directions entirely. I, I don't think that serves anyone, particularly not the pet. No, definitely not. I, I, I am the same way. I love opening those conversations and hearing what the other side is and the other perspective and trying to find some common middle ground. Um, I, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, do you think, can you give me some ideas of what, what types of dogs that you think do better on kibble or pets in general do better on um, formulated kibble rather than a homemade prepared diet? Is that specifically because of being able to have a stable um, uh, not plethora, I guess, uh, very stable ingredients. Like we were talking about crop sourcing and meat sourcing and things like that. Would that be more the type of animal that you would push in the direction of using a formulated kibble rather than a homemade diet? Um, I think sometimes it comes down to the owners as well, whether they have the resources available to be able to do it well. Um, that, that can play into it. Uh, consistency is really important. And certainly if we talk about the therapeutic diets that are made by a few of the manufacturers, they're very tightly regulated um, in sourcing. They'll try and use ingredients that are really uh, quite constricted in their nutrient profiles. Uh, like the hydrolyzed they, proteins? Yeah, well, they exactly. And they vary, very, uh, very little. You know, that things you mentioned, hydrolyzed proteins, things, ingredients like that, it's just not available to us as consumers. You know, we have to buy those uh, through other companies. So, yeah, if you have animals that acquire sensitivities, uh, dietary sensitivities rapidly, uh, they can be a godsend. You know, we can't match anything like that um, home prepared diets. Uh, there are specific nutrient profiles that are really tricky too. And, you know, I, I think uh, one of the ones that comes to mind is, is dogs and cats with renal disease. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people will try different renal therapeutic diets and find that their, their cat or dog doesn't accept them readily, or they develop fixed um, aversions along the way from uremic episodes, et cetera. And, and so for those guys, they might be looking for a home prepared alternative and they know the dog likes to eat some specific home prepared ingredients. But when you actually formulate that diet out to be low in protein, low in phosphorus, low in sodium, um, you're dropping away a lot of the palatability uh, drivers. And so you can, can end up with a home prepared diet uh, that by the time it matches the nutrient profile that we're trying to achieve for the animal, it isn't any more palatable than the commercial diets. You know, these, these companies, uh, they spend uh, inordinate amounts of money uh, researching their diets to try and make them more palatable uh, than, than their competitors. It's one of their big uh, areas that they compete on. 
And so certainly for therapeutic diets, for dogs and cats that have um, reduced uh, desire to eat, uh, companies are really cognizant of that and they try and uh, really pull a lot of tricks out. You know, they, they have, I know there's companies that have uh, people that their sole job is to smell different aromas that they then use on the kibbles to try and make them more palatable. And, you know, they, they, they spend a lot of time doing that. And we can't match those resources uh, on an individual home prepared diet um, uh, level. That makes sense. You'd think they use dogs to sniff each one of them instead of, of humans or cats to sniff they, them. They tend to. Do. They, they do palatability trials um, uh, once they've narrowed it down a little bit. But, yeah, they have uh, equivalent to sommeliers, you know, with wine. They have people that just yes. smell kibble and whatever to uh, pick up the different aromas. And I'm sure they have uh, skills and abilities that I've, I've never developed anyway. And I'd be quite <laughs> jealous, I'd imagine. That doesn't sound as fun as uh, smelling the aromas of different wines, but whatever, <laughs> to each their own, right? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't drink any alcohol anymore, so uh, but I remember fondly uh, what that was like. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about proteins, um, if you don't mind, because I've heard both sides of the fence. There's always seems to be this back and forth about find proteins that work um, and stick with those proteins and stick with the, only those proteins, because if yeah. dogs develop intolerances or allergies, you need to have a variety so that you can change their diet to something that won't cause a reaction. And then on the yeah. other side of that fence is this argument, no, you need to give them variety in their diet. You should be feeding yeah. different types of proteins. You should be giving them the chicken, the beef, the turkey, yeah. the pork, you know, yeah. kind of mixing it up. So what are your thoughts on that? I think it, it's really hard to make a blanket statement with a, a diverse population. Um, I think there are individuals out there that can eat just about anything and be perfectly healthy and never develop any intolerances and probably have some nutritional benefit from altering. I'm a big fan, even with commercial diets, if you don't have very specific needs, uh, you know, feed diets from different manufacturers over time, uh, feed different diets over time. Hopefully they still all fall within that spectrum of what works for that individual pet. Um, but, you know, you're going to get away from any potential toxicity buildup over time, any micronutrient deficiencies that might actually be in a diet by burying them over time. So I like variety. But you're dead right. I've seen the other side of that where you're trying to come up with a home-prepared recipe that has novel ingredients for an individual that has vast intolerances and you end up having to formulate a diet with crocodile or frog or something <laughs> really absurd. And so, you know, I think my, my, what I'd like to see is some sort of middle ground, you know, where we have um, a lot of the, the common ingredients. Um, the truth is that the, the common allergens, the common sensitivities tend to be the common ingredients. And so if we talk about what are the most common ingredients that cause sensitivities, it's chicken and beef and milk and all the very commonly fed ones. And it may not be anything uh, particularly allergenic with those at all, particularly stimulating. It, it may just be the pure exposure. And that's, that's what tends to happen with us anyway. When we find a novel ingredient for an individual, we feed it for a while, and it's not particularly uncommon that they develop a new sensitivity over time. And some of those older sensitivities can wane. And so it can genuinely be a moving target. So I, I would like maybe to stay away from some of the more unusual ingredients because then we have that flexibility to use it if need be uh, since the advent of um, hydrolyzed diets that you were talking about before i'm less concerned about that um, because we have such good hydrolyzed diet uh, options and they are hydrolyzed at a level where the animals can't acquire new sensitivities so for those individuals that do acquire new sensitivities when ingredients are fed uh, they're a wonderful alternative. So it's probably a little bit less of a concern than it used to be. Um, the ones that we run into trouble with is if they've been exposed to a whole raft of different ingredients and they have other conditions. So they have fat intolerance on top of it or they have chronic renal failure on top of it. And then we have to start modulating uh, nutrient profiles uh, and trying to do that with, you know, one or two ingredients that we have available. We just don't have that same degree of flexibility. Um, so, yeah, I think there's probably a, a reasonable middle ground, you know, where we don't need to have rabbit in every formulation. Um, we don't have to have uh, bison in every formulation. Um, but, you know, we can hopefully, uh, you know, have a few ingredients up our sleeve. 
Gotcha. Yeah. And I'm really curious to see as the, the research tends to come out more um, about the the nutritional availability of some of the proteins too, because one of the reasons that um, at least a veterinarian friend of mine was telling me that, you know, she tends to push people more in the direction of sticking to the common types of proteins, even though there's more likelihood of an intolerance or an allergic response is because there's so much unknown about some of these boutique diets. Like you mentioned crocodile or, you know, kangaroo, you're in Australia. Um, but not really knowing how nutritionally available some of these proteins yeah. are and how the In body breaks it down. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So combinations as well, when you put different ingredients together, you know, uh, that was the lamb, meal and brown rice uh, issue around taurine. Mm. If you uh, yeah. actually assess the ingredients individually, they have adequate taurine levels. But if you have brown rice that, you know, acts uh, to increase bacterial fermentation, that then sequesters away some of the uh, taurine that was available in the diet and makes it unavailable to the animal. There's a whole raft of complexities there that until you put a diet through feeding trials, it's really hard to know. And, and certainly for some of the – a feeding trial, a, an AFCO feeding trial, it's quite constrained and you can go to the text and look specifically at how many animals and for how long they've fed, et cetera, and what testing is done. But there are nutrient deficiencies that won't manifest in that time frame. And so, you know, if you if you go to that WSABA nutrition toolkit, uh, my mind's moving faster than my mouth. Sorry, WSABA nutrition toolkit. If you Google that and look at how we uh, how they recommend you assess a, a commercial diet, how you pick a commercial diet, um, I think you can get uh, a whole raft of information there, and it won't just be around, you know, feeding trials. It'll also be for looking for a manufacturer that has a nutritionist or researchers on staff. It'll be about trying to find a diet that's been on the market for uh, for quite some time, so that hopefully, if there was an issue, it's been recognised uh, prior. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think you know it, it, it's prudent to go through and have that thought process and, and think a little bit more widely about it. Now, have I gone vastly off topic? I can't remember what the question was that you asked. But No, not at all. Not at all. Um, and actually, the, the website that you mentioned, I'll put a link in the show notes so people can go directly to that if they're interested in helping, you know, as far as yeah. kibble diets are concerned, looking for something that's manufactured. But um, there, there's some other questions other, I have. Before you go on, sorry, there's a couple of other really yeah. great resources in there as well. So there's resources on body condition score. I mean, uh, overweight and obese pets are yes. still one of the, the major problems we see from a nutritional perspective. Um, Overnutrition is as important as undernutrition. So, uh, you know, if you're poking around on there, having a look, have a look at the body condition score um, charts and the videos um, and, you know, sh share that information with your friends in a delicate uh, way. <laughs> Probably more delicate than I typically put it. <laughs> um, well, and I, I like that you mentioned that. That's really important because um, even in what I do, I get asked pretty frequently, how much do you think my dog should weigh? Um, first yeah. of all, I'm like, I'm not really qualified to answer that. But second, it's more about their body size and that body image. And, you know, if yeah. you can just barely lightly see the ribs and can you see the waistline? So that score chart really helps give you yeah, a yeah. visual representation as to whether your dog is within ideal rate or not. It's not about, oh, how yeah. much should my dog weigh? I mean, you yeah. think about just I mean, breed varieties. My pit bull, who is, you know, a very medium sized dog weighs more than a very long, lean, leggy, you know, Labrador retriever. But exactly. The, the body shape um, variation in dogs is, is quite incredible. You know, and we yeah. talk about the limitations of BMI for humans. If, you, if you've got a person that's particularly muscular as opposed to overweight, you know, you know we, the honest truth is unless we blend an animal up, we're not going to know 100% what its body composition is. But those body condition score charts, they've been verified against uh, all sorts of advanced technologies, uh, DEXA scans and, uh, you know, radioactive isotope technology. That, they're, they're, they're pretty useful from a clinical perspective. Um, and so, you know, it is about getting that body shape back. Uh, you, you must have spent some time in clinics and, you know, you, you'll see some Labrador retrievers that are this tall and you'll see some Labrador retrievers that are that tall and you see some Labrador retrievers that look like a boxer, but mm, you're going to tell the owner that they probably are a Labrador. You know, the honest truth is the, the variation within that breed can be quite fast. And so trying to come up with some magic number of, of what that animal should weigh, it's always made up. Um, it's it's a simplicity mm -hmm. again that we like in our in our minds to go to. But uh, body shape, body condition score is is vastly more important than any magic number. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that point up. I'll definitely put that resource um, in the show notes. 
Um, I want to go back to what you were talking about when diets aren't working, when you were talking about how you can see these micro fractures. Um, and the one thing that I always tend to point out to people is, you know, when, when I, when I look at a behavior case, I always look at pain to start with because oftentimes it's something that's missed, especially when you have mm -hmm. an acute behavioral issue. And when it comes to diet, you know, how can people really judge whether something's working or not? You obviously don't want to get to the point where you could potentially have something like those fractures, but also you might not necessarily know just given how stoic animals are that they're not really showing signs of pain or showing signs of illness or disease until they're well into that process, mm -hmm. that disease process. So what, what do you typically yeah. give owners as a way to help kind of gauge, you know, how well this diet is working, particularly for their, their pet? Well, it comes back to some of that monitoring we talked about earlier, but um, it's, it's difficult. I'll, you're right. It's really difficult with some nutrient deficiencies to pick them up prior to catastrophic consequences. Uh, you know, and certainly when, you know, researchers were working out what the nutrient uh, levels should be, they had to feed animals different levels to try and work out what was adequate, what was the minimum requirement, what was toxic, et cetera. And so th this research has been done and it's, you know, some of the deficiency states are horrendous, things we don't want to see. Some of the toxicity states are horrendous and things you don't want to see. Um, there are those stages of deficiency. You go from, you know, feeding a complete and balanced uh, level of a nutrient to some sort of compensated deficiency where the body has um, other uh, physiologic processes that will cover that deficiency. And then you go to a decompensated deficiency where you start to get in, in the level of calcium, you'd start to get bone loss, um, you know, osteoporosis and, and loss of bone density over time. And then it manifests as a clinical problem. Uh, all you can try to do if we're worried about uh, those clinical problems is catch them before they get to that level. And, you know, the only way we're going to do that is with blood testing, urine testing, there are specific physiologic tests that you can do, but they're not things that your average clinician is used to. Again, these are the things that are really only are done on a research setting at the moment. Um, so if we wanted to get back to those, you know, again, maybe in time, if we start feeding more individualized diets, that sort of raft of testing might be commonplace. It might be like we do a general health profile now. You know, it may be part of some, one of these considerations coming annually we do a blood test, we look at your underlying physiologic process levels and we work out whether you need more or less of a specific nutrient before you get to that level. But from a, from a current pragmatic clinical level, it's just not done at this stage. So, you know, uh, looking at those, uh, those general clinical indicators, while they're wonderful, coat health, uh, defecation frequency and the nature of the feces. Now, they're all the things that owners are attuned to looking at. They're all the things that we look at as general indicators of health. Um, and they're, they're not wrong, but they are coarse. They are uh, less, they're, they're less good as early indicators. Gotcha. So would you say that it's... Um important for dog owners that are switching to a homemade diet, whether they formulate it or it's formulated elsewhere, um, that they get a baseline as far as lab work is concerned. And then how frequently would they um, test after that to kind of see how things are going internally? So I'll, I'll give you my, it, it, again, there's some variation depending on whether they've got pre-existing conditions and whether we need to be monitoring those closely, because sometimes we're looking for really specific nutrient impacts from the diet. So that might require more frequent testing, but certainly from, you know, a healthy animal that you're feeding a home prepared diet with that we don't know about digestibility, absorption, et cetera, in your individual dog, uh, I would think running your routine blood work at least annually uh, would be a really good idea, a really good idea. You know, and then, you know, if I was worried about calcium metabolism because I've done something a little bit differently, uh, I've certainly uh, suggested uh, I'll, x-rays periodically just to check and try and catch them at a level before you get to a, a sinister uh, outcome.
Gotcha. So it really isn't much more of a burden then because um, I don't know how it is in Australia, but for the most part, the recommendations here in the United States are that if you have a healthy adult dog that they're seen annually and they complete a CBC chem panel annually. And then if you have a senior dog, which is typically seven or over, obviously that varies with breed and size that they're seen every six months and lab work is actually run every six months. So it's really not much more of a a burden as far as testing is concerned to switch over to a a greater emphasis again to uh, follow those recommendations yeah yeah um what are the most common disease processes that usually recommend a dog be on a homemade diet for is it typically something kidney related or liver related or what do you see more frequently yeah i think uh, kidney disease pancreatitis where we don't have commercial diet that's low enough in fat Uh, Uh, that's one of those conditions that's really individual and there are some animals that just don't tolerate um even uh restricted levels of fat so we have to go ultra restricted um, inflammatory bowel disease, sometimes people will want to try different um, uh, ingredients, different uh, baseline ingredients to see if they'll help, help as well. Uh, Lymphangiectasia, again, with uh, fat intolerance, uh, they probably be the most common sort of ones that we do. So strangely, kind of off topic, but I'm curious, I, I a Royal Canin representative told me about this once that um, they actually spray fat on top of the kibble to make them more palatable. Yeah. Do you think that contributes to any issue that they're doing that or? Well, I, I don't know if it contributes, but certainly there's individuals that won't do well with that. Um, I, I don't think that's a particularly uncommon thing. Oft, often um, the, the companies do spray some sort of digest or flavorant uh, on the outside of the kibble. That, that's a relatively common process. Um, so, certainly uh, the, the one that comes to my mind is, is uh, the, some of the dental diets. Um, mm-hmm. that have high fiber levels, they actually need to have low fat levels through the kibble in order to get the consistency that helps with dental uh, abrasion. And so they'll often put the fat on the outside of those to uh, still get adequate levels of fat into the, into the diet uh, while maintaining the texture they need within the kibble. And so I think they, they play some clever tricks like that sometimes. But um, for, for the most part, um, they don't tend to have uh, excessively high levels of fat. It's just the distribution within the kibble might be uh, might be different. Uh, that's not to say there aren't individuals that uh, don't tolerate normal levels. Of course, we know that's that's you know that's that subset of the population. Well, and I, I want to ask you a question regarding dental disease too, because um, you know, growing up, when we, we, I was always told, uh, especially when I first started, I was a veterinary nurse. You know, I was young, sixteen years old. They're like don't feed your dogs wet food unless you absolutely have to, because it um, can contribute to dental disease, given that it sits on the teeth, you know, that moisture sits on the teeth. It doesn't rub against it like kibble does. Um, is, is that kind of a myth or do you think that that's an, a, an appropriate assessment about uh, soft foods or wet foods? Uh, I think if you're only feeding soft foods, that probably has some, some weight to it. Um, there's a, again, it depends on your viewpoint uh, from a, uh, a really sort of global sustainability uh, perspective, moving wet food around, producing wet food, transporting it around the country, that there's a reason that it's more expensive to feed that way. Um, but it also, you know, uses a lot of additional resources. And we, we live in a time where we're trying to be a little bit more considerate of uh, resources for the rest of the human population and the planet. And so, you know, wet food doesn't play well when you start thinking about it from that perspective. Um, you know, there, I'm glad that we haven't, though, because there are individuals that need higher moisture diets. You know, certainly um, dogs and cats that have had kidney stones or bladder stones might benefit from a higher moisture diet. Uh, cats with constipation might benefit from a higher moisture diet. And so I guess what I tell people um, as, a, as a general rule is, is try and feed a, feed a few different consistencies, particularly as animals are growing up, so they recognise it as food. So that if your animal is unlucky enough to have very specific needs later on, you've got that option. You can dial it in again. Um, so I, I think, again, just saying dry food is always the way is a little bit short-sighted. Uh, just saying wet food is always the way. I think, again, some variety, some middle ground is probably the way to go. And then you have those consistency options later on if, uh, if need be. Uh, if we if we could in some way predictably work out what an individual's disease risk was for later in life, uh, we could be a whole lot more specific. You know, so if we knew that this dog was going to develop kidney disease later in life, we would be a lot more restricted uh, around the nutrients that might impact that as we go through life. 
But really what we're trying to do when you start talking about populations of breeds or sexes or whatever is we're trying to go, you know, how do we lower uh, disease as a, as a global statement? You know, we're not just trying to mitigate risk for orthopaedic disease. We're not just trying to mitigate risk for kidney disease, but, you know, it, it, dental disease. It, it all comes into a, a bit more of a global consideration, I think. Well, interestingly enough, too, um, the the food that I feed my dogs is nom nom. It's a fresh food. It's prepared and they portion it out into packets, you know, based on the dog's age. But something that they offer as well, which I think is interesting, is um, a gut microbiome health test. And it's a DNA test. And I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not educated enough to know all the ins and outs about it. But um, supposedly what they're kind of touting is that it gives them a better idea of what type of nutritional profile that the animal needs to be on, whether it's a dog or a cat. How accurate do you think testing like that is? Again, I'm not sure my understanding's current, but, you know, when I've looked at it along the way, I think, again, it's very well-intentioned and a lot of it is um, extrapolated from preliminary data, some research data, often in other species, humans or rats or whatever, and then we try and uh, equilibrate that to dogs and cats. Uh, and so when I've actually pulled that apart to critically assess it, uh, I must admit that I haven't sort of been particularly impressed up to what I've seen so far. Um, I say that knowing that in time, that sort of thought process, that sort of development probably has water. It probably will show real promise and show real benefit in time. Uh, I'm just not sure we have the required level of understanding and data to really make a lot of firm recommendations at the moment. But that's, kind of you know, early in the process. that's not all at the moment. Yeah. Uh, talking about home prepared dogs, it's just something that came to my mind um, while we were chatting then. But uh, one of the big issues we have, uh, as I've said, is, is dogs eating selective ingredients and leaving out the ones that they don't like to eat, which are often the supplements and the highly nutrient-rich uh, bits. Um, and that can be a risk. But as well as that, um, Often we have owners that make subtle tweaks and changes over time. And I think our biases allow us to do that because they want us to feed something that is a little bit easier and a little bit more palatable to the animal. And so our, our minds head us in that direction unintentionally uh, or unconsciously at least. Um, and so, you know, I know uh, Nick Cave at a Massey University did a study. He had his residents ring each of the people they produced home prepared diet recipes for uh, and ask them to provide the recipe that they were currently feeding. Um, and I, I don't know if you and I have already had this discussion or not, I, I don't recall, but uh, can you have a guess at what percentage of the animals were still getting fed the diet recipe as they originally formulated? You mean the very specific formulation? The, the, yeah, so the specific formulation that they'd given the owner and said, if you feed this, it will be as close to complete and balanced as we can make it. So, I'm going to guess that's really low. <laughs> really low. Zero percent it was. <laughs> so <laughs> that is not honest, low. Is I'm thinking like low. 20, 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. you know, the, the risk is that, you know, all of a sudden your local supermarket doesn't have the specific ingredient you are meant to be using. So, you know, well, I don't have chicken breast there, but I do have chicken leg, and so I'll use that. And then I'll, well, you know, the dog really likes that because it's a little bit higher in fat. And then I can't get that specific uh, supplement, but this one looks like it has vaguely the same. And, and I think those subtle changes uh, can be pretty significant. Um, and, you know, when I hear little studies like that, it makes me a little bit terrified, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think um, we understand the risk we take when we formulate a diet recipe. We understand that we can't put it through feeding trials. We can't do the same level of testing of, the ingredients when they go into the diet. We can't do the same level of uh, end product testing. Uh, all of those uh, have to go by the wayside when we choose to do a home prepared diet. And then when you think about diets, eating, uh, the animals eating them selectively and the owners then making subtle um, manipulations, uh, all of that uh, adds to my uh, impending terror. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you think about dogs with allergies that you're, you're doing food trials with them to see what specifically it is that they're allergic to. And, and when you're, you're, you know, questioning them at their next routine checkup and you're like, okay, so your dog hasn't had 
any access to any other foods aside from the very specific, you know, diet that we've put them on to, to do this food allergy trial. Like, oh, no, no, no. Well, your dog's still itchy and has hives and has red skin and is licking like what's going on. And oh, yeah, I gave my heartworm preventive, which has beef in it. And we're testing against beef. You know, we're, we're trying a different protein. Or I just gave him one little bite from my dinner plate. You know, and it's compliance is huge. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I got to say that number still shocks me. The owners, I've been on the other end of this. Like I've had to give my animal, I remember a cat I had and I had to give it heart heart medication for a while. And I I am no better. Hands up, I am no better than the clients that I sometimes (laughs) criticise because it's bloody difficult sometimes. It's difficult to find the animal. It's difficult to find the tablet sometimes and it's difficult to convince. And I, I, I like to think I'm pretty good at it at work. But I understand that when you're in your home environment, uh, things can be different. And so, I, you know, I have a great deal of empathy and understanding around that, but it doesn't take away from the, the fact that I think it, it can lead to some really serious consequences. And so, I, you know, I, I think, uh, again, you know, for people that have uh, disabilities or for people that have limited time, uh, commercial diets can be a beneficial thing. Uh, home diets have their, have their place. And I think, um, you know, we, we can look to constantly improve how we do that to make it as safe as we possibly can and as beneficial to those individuals as we possibly can. And I'm glad that we have it as an option uh, for those individuals that really, truly need it. Um, and I feel the same about every other diet modality. Yeah, I mean, it, it really boils down to the fact that nutrition is not general. And we try to make it general. We try to formulate these dials that diets that are generalized, but it's really not, it's not black or white. There's a whole lot of gray in between and so many different variables. And it's not one of those things that you can get on your high horse on social media and be like, homemade diets are terrible or homemade diets are the best. You know, it it really depends on the the honest truth is both of those, both of those comments are absolutely right. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I, I think what, what we, what we always do, and I think it's a human trait is we try and take uh, a very complicated uh, question and ask it in a simple way and want, want a simple answer, you know? Uh, you know, I'm reminded, is it the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? You know, the answer's 42, you know? We want the simple answers and, and uh, life's sometimes not like that. Um, you know, you can make the answers as simple as possible, but they've still got to embrace the complexity that is, you know, the reality of, of our existence. And so I, I think, you know... It, There are individuals, if they're perfectly healthy, if they don't have specific nutrient needs, um, where the honest truth is they could probably do well on 10,000 different diets. They would probably live a similar lifespan, be perfectly happy and content uh, with a a variety of different approaches. Uh, And then you, as a a pet owner, if you're lucky enough to have one of those animals, then you you do have the choice around, uh, you know, different diet modalities. And you'll, you'll do less harm if you consider how you do that safely, whether you're feeding a commercial diet or a home prepared diet, um, you know, if you go through that thought process. Um, but, you know, for there are individuals out there where, you know, that of those 10,000 diets, there might only be one uh, that works or there might not be any and we might have to come up with something. So it's, it's nice to have the variety out there. I'm, for every manufacturer that comes on board, I'm, I'm glad to see them because they often have a unique perspective and they create a a unique diet and it it all adds to uh, the variety that we're able to choose from. Is there anywhere that like a lot of this information is, is just being data dumped. So whether they're manufacturing companies, experts like yourself, is there any kind of one um, resource where all of these people in all of these different positions are kind of coming together to share all of this knowledge in a common place about what they're finding in their studies, whether again, whether it's a manufacturer or whether it's somebody like you, that's kind of off on your own. Does something like that exist? A lot of crossover. I mean, the the trouble with, Textbooks are a great resource to start with, but they're always five to 10 years out of date by the time they come Mm -hmm. out. Um, You know, electronic publishing and all the rest will improve uh, accessibility and timeframes maybe. Uh, You know, you you understand with professional development how difficult that is to stay current. Uh, You you read a lot of different journals. You you talk to a lot of other experts in the field. You go to conferences um, and it's all aimed at trying to stay vaguely current. Um, certainly with pet foods, there's been a, a few different people try at different times to come up with a collated um, database, online database that people can search and it will have 
uh, the manufacturer's details, the food details, the form of the diet, uh, protein level, fat level, carbohydrate level, micronutrient level, specific characteristics. Um, and, and the trouble is with the, the, the volume uh, of diets that are available in that commercial market, uh, it's just not current. As soon as you produce it, it's out of date because mm. the manufacturers are constantly doing research and tweaking their products. If they don't have specific nutrient needs, often diets are made on least cost formulation. And sometimes, it, you know, one batch might vary from the other. Um, and it, trying to keep uh, a database, uh, I've, seen, I've seen it tried uh, a number of times and it's, it's, it's near impossible to keep it current. Gotcha. Wow. I so what, what we do is sure. the long-handed way of doing it. When we have an animal fed a specific diet, uh, I often will ring the manufacturer and say, can I have the information on that diet? It, it's time consuming. Uh, it's frustrating sometimes, <laughs> but it's the only way of making sure you get the most up-to-date information because what was true this week might not be true next week, might not be true next month. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, it's a real moving target, unfortunately. Well, and um, even with the change in a change in ownership from company to company to company. Like, you know, uh, Blue Wilderness or Blue Buffalo rather had that problem for quite some time where I guess they had changed hands or ownership. And then all of a sudden the, um, the nutritional quality had changed in the diet itself. So even if you know, you know, what this dog is on, what their diet is at, at point A, again, it's a snapshot, you know, the next time that you check that or test that, it could be under different ownership, different manufacturing plants. They could be sourcing from other places, kind of like you'd mentioned before. Yeah. So that, and I've seen that play both ways. I've seen it improve products and I've seen it um, cause product deterioration. Uh, I'll tell a story without a manufacturer's name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 I rang a company once to get some information uh, on their diet. And uh, after talking to a couple of different people, I got put through uh, to this guy who was going to help me. And he, he said, well, you know, they've just made me hell of, head of quality control, whatever that means. <laughs> I was just like, if you don't know what it means, I'm pretty sure it doesn't mean <laughs> So, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we do have to be careful um, because you, you're right, you know, there, there are people out there. No, no one's an expert in everything. And, you know, so I think, you know, one of, the, one of the things you learn through any avenue when you really start burrowing down on it is, is the, the, the benefit that comes from having uh, collaborations between like-minded uh, people who have different interests or different areas of expertise. You know, and so certainly for a uh, even a, a kibble, to, to be simple, uh, to produce a kibble, you need a, an expert in nutrition. Uh, you also probably want a toxicologist screening products on the way in. Uh, you want someone who's an expert in packaging. Uh, you, they, they probably will have an expert in marketing. That's probably one of the first guys to get hired. Um, and then, you know, you, you'll also probably want a microbiologist and you'll, you'll want uh, someone who... It deals with the extrusion technology, uh, you know, an engineer. And, and, and so you, you have to have a, a vast array of special specializations uh, to make a good product, uh, even for a relatively simple product. Well, I, I got to tell you, that's what actually drew me to the food that I'm feeding now is that they have a team of scientists. Pretty yeah. much everyone that you just listed is on their team to formulate these diets, including a board certified veterinary nutritionist, but they have a microbiologist, head of bioinformatics, um, you know, quality control, whatever that means. Um, yeah. But they have this team of people that are working on it and they do have a marketing department as well, of course, to get this product. Yeah. Well, I, I think out. that we, we could cr criticize that. I could certainly say, you know, all marketing is bad around pet food. But, you know, it's the same with the cars we buy and the jeans we yeah. wear. Uh, I think this is just the world we live in is going to be marketing heavy. I, I, I think until we have some global shakeup, uh, this is the world we live in. But it scares me because perception is totally reality. So if you have a really great marketing team and a terrible product, you're going to get a lot of terrible product out there before anybody is any the wiser. You know, that's, that's how it, that, I feel like that's what's happened with grain free. You know, before these diets were really formulated and were really truly tested they created a lot of havoc and you can still walk into any pet store here at least in the u.s and it's grain free grain free grain free because they feel like they have to get that on the shelf because that's what yeah. sells without the education behind it so it's yeah. interesting but um, the funny, you know the thing is grain free like there, there's there's been products that have been grain free for decades on the market and have done a tremendous job because they did all the regular research and product yeah. development you know, and they those those grain free diets were perfectly healthy, perfectly you know reasonable diets to feed. 
uh, in the rush to get onto that marketing boom when the fashion came to town, mm. you're right that people produce diets without all the normal considerations, and that's where they ran into trouble. And it was, you know, sheer enthusiasm rather than anything else. But the marketing, it, it, certainly in this digital landscape, it's so simple to have an engaging, uh, brilliant marketing scheme uh, around a product with, with very little um, basis behind it. And I feel people are pretty easily swayed if it's pretty, you know, oh, you go after it. It, it, it is the good. most effective, simple technique to say uh, we don't have something in the product. Uh, that negative advertising is is, is one of the most uh, effective techniques and it plays into our human psyche. You know, if, if we say uh, no something, anything, no fibre, no fibre in our diets, <laughs> in, you know, the first time you see that, you go, oh, I wonder if that, that is. And then the second or third time you see it, well, no one's putting fibre. Well, this is my product has fibre in it, you know. And it, it, so I think it, it is just... It, it, marketing folks know how that works. They know that we are susceptible to that. And if they choose to play that game, unfortunately, our poor old human brains uh, are just not equipped to deal with it. And so, you know, we are prone to getting caught out. Uh, you have to be, uh, I think, you, we try to be as scientists to be equally critical across the board, to critique everything the same way. Um, and, and that takes practice and it takes uh, genuine uh, consideration because it, it, it's not how the human brain is set up to work, unfortunately. No, unfortunately not. Um, but it, it, again, I shouldn't be necessarily making nutrition requirements, but when people do come to me and do ask, because I do ask about that on my behavior profiles and try to kind of at least push them in the right direction of further educating themselves yeah. on what's the best nutrition option for their dogs. I always tell them, look for the team of scientists. Don't, don't look at the flashy advertising. I know it looks pretty, but go to their site, go to their sources, see if you can find their ingredients, see if you can find yeah. who formulated their ingredients. And when it comes to homemade diets, I always push them off to um, the American College of Veterinary Nutrition. I'm like, just go to the experts. If you're going to formulate a homemade diet, do it the right way. If you're going to invest that into your pet because you love your pet and you want them to have a long life, especially mitigating the disease process, then, then put all of your eggs in that basket and go to that resource and utilize somebody like yourself who has all of this education and experience and data and knowledge that they can help you kind of weed through all the crap, so to speak, and, and uh, put something together that's actually going to work well for your dog or cat. Send them other places. I'm not looking for work. So, you know, I, I'm certainly, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we're, I'm, I'm trying to help people as much as I can. Um, but there are good resources there. And those, those mm -hmm. impartial resources, whether it's the American College of Vet Nutrition, WSABA, if you can find those guys and try and find something that is uh, less biased, uh, that, that's about as much as you can ask for. And then if you follow their recommendations, I think you're heading in the right direction. Uh, it means that we have to be open-minded again when you do that. And, you know, you have to critique across the board equally. You have to think about the pros and cons. It all takes more mental energy. Uh, but the result you'll get will be vastly, vastly better. Yeah. Do you, um, I know that you're in a different country, so this could be a very difficult question to answer, but off the top of your head, as far as cost efficiency is concerned, if someone's looking into bringing a professional on board like yourself, not you because you're booked right now, um, what kind of investment is that for them up front to have their animal profile done, all that lab work done and, and have a diet actually formulated to meet the needs of their pet? Well, again, I think most nutritionists will send you back to your regular veterinarian to get a lot of the initial lab work and everything done. So uh, that's not something I'm directly uh, in line with. But, you know, uh, I'd imagine that to run regular bloods and urinalyses and maybe get a thyroid level done if you've got an overweight pet or whatever, you're going to spend a few hundred dollars. You're going to spend a few hundred dollars to get that information before you start. Uh, most nutritionists, there, are, there is some variation in what they charge depending on the technology they use, how individualised they need to make that formulation, uh, how much time is involved. So, you know, I've spent anything from two hours to 40 hours working on a specific formulation for an animal. Wow. So it can be, can be pretty time-consuming. Um, so there will be some variation there. But, it, you know, again, you have to be in the realm of uh, considering spending a couple of hundred dollars to get a diet recipe formulated. Uh, then by the time you buy the ingredients and get yourself set up to produce it, 
Uh, again, there's some investment there, maybe with uh, blenders or cooking equipment or whatever. So, you know, I think realistically, if you're going to do it well, you're probably looking at investing maybe $1,000 in, in that line to try and see if you can come up with something that's going to work for your pet. That, that, that'd be my sort of ballpark. It's always, I think, a more expensive way of doing it if you're going to do it well. Yeah. Well, for people that are that concerned or, you know, are their animals are further along in a specific disease process, you know, you can think about it for the longevity of the dog is, is what time that they have left with us worth that amount as far as an investment goes. Yeah. And there is no right or wrong that that's a personal choice and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. It's something that you have to think about um, from a personal perspective as to whether it's right or not. I mean, you know, for example, I have a 15 year old dog. If, you know, he's <laughs> advanced in a disease process and you said, well, we can spend a thousand dollars and we can change his diet. I might be like, well, he's kind of on his last leg as it is. And, you know, I'm probably going to put more of that effort into my younger dog who's only three or four years old. Or I might think, okay, but he's a healthy 15 year old dog and he might have three, four more yeah. years if he's a smaller breed. So a lot to think about just you know, individually, it, it really is individual based. There's not really oh, yeah. from yeah, some people are incredibly connected and, uh, to their pets and uh, they have a lot of resources. And so, you know, I think, you know, if you've got a, uh, a personal chef that can help you prepare, then, you know, it makes a, a, all of life easier. So, you know, yeah, I think there are a, a bunch of options that, you know, and that's why I, I think I, I try and play the middle ground. And so most of the time when I'm talking to people, I, will try and give them the more general answers, you know, the, 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 the more correct answer, uh, which is that there is all this complexity and all the rest. And then, you know, if, if they actually come to me at the end and say, what would you do in my circumstance? Uh, I honestly think that that's what they're engaging us for a lot of the time. And so, you know, while I try and give them all the information to make the decision themselves, if they want to know what my decision would be in their shoes, uh, I don't feel bad sharing that. Um, and it is variable. <laughs> But, you know, the, I think, think in a way that is our job sometimes is to, to, to just be really honest with people about what we would do if, if we were in their particular situation. Well, I think that really makes people feel much more comfortable with their decision making. You know, I, I leaned on somebody that really knows this field and knows what they're doing. And I can feel comfortable in the decision that I've made for my pet. I think that's just yeah, yeah. covering some good bases and, and kind of takes a lot off their conscience. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, I, I guess what I see with a lot of veterinarians is they have a lot more information and understanding around nutrition than they give themselves credit for. And you're probably one of those people. I think you have a, a vast um, uh, understanding of it. So I think, um, you know, we tend to downplay it. We, and the trouble is, you know, when we downplay it, um, you know, the kid next door who spent five minutes Googling and thinking about it, um, often isn't shy sharing their opinion at all. And <laughs> yes. you know, again, our, our 10,000 year old technology that we carry around in our minds loves enthusiasm, loves, um, you know, a, a level of confidence. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes we overrepresent those uh, less considered opinions, the simpler opinions. And I, I think we have to be careful uh, to, to balance that. I think a lot of the time I'd, I'd like to see uh, our, our veterinarians, our people that have actually spent, you know, a lot more time thinking through this, a lot more time working in this realm, uh, be a little bit more confident with their um, opinions because I, I think sometimes they undervalue uh, their level of understanding. Well, I think vets have it hard. I really feel bad for them often. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, oh, my vet's so expensive. I need a more affordable option. And, and meanwhile, some of these private practice veterinarians are struggling to get by. They're not bringing enough yeah. income in to keep you know, good staff and, and keep their lights on. And people have this misunderstanding that vets are out to get them for their money. And I, I always tell people, trust me when I say a veterinarian didn't go into that position because it's all about the Benjis. Like they're not rolling in cash. No, they no, there's, are there there's, because it's there's, a there's hard call. To make money, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I uh, yeah, I, I, you know, and I'll speak in generalities that there, there might be exceptions to the rule, but as a, as a generality, I think people are drawn to this profession um, you know, they're drawn uh, for the philosophical belief that we're helping animals and owners. Uh, mm. That is still my greatest desire. And I think it's probably the greatest desire of most vets. And when I say vets, I'm talking about that whole vet care team, uh, the technicians and the, the receptionists and the clinic. They, they tend to all have that same philosophy. And when a okay. clinic's working well, everyone's heading in that direction. 
uh, it, it makes them be able to tolerate uh, a lot of the really tough stuff that we deal with. Um, but, you know, it, it's certainly not easy work. It's not simple work and it's not particularly financially rewarding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, from a philosophical perspective, uh, it's wonderful work because, you know, we, we get to do what we set out to do uh, every day. You know, we, we get to uh, genuinely at times um, involve ourselves in procedures or modifications that save animals' lives. And, you know, that's a big deal. We get to relieve suffering when, when that time comes as well. I, I think there are, there are things that make it uh, incredibly rewarding that, um, that yeah, it doesn't tend to be the financial bit. <laughs> yes. And literally, I think everything that you stated is why people need to trust their veterinarians, why they need to lean on their expertise and understand that they're coming from a, a place not only of compassion, but a place of um, true intent for the overall best health and wellness for for. Yeah. Animals. I think owners uh, do desire that and, and should desire that. And, and if they don't have it, they should seek it. Um, I think, you know, we, we have a variety of different personalities within our profession. And again, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we sometimes think in different directions and all the rest. But if you can find someone that you connect with, that you communicate readily with, uh, that, that's it. You know, that, that's the biggest part of it. That open communication, respect for each other, that understanding, that relationship that you build over time, um, you know, that that's the thing that leads to optimise uh, healthcare, I think. Yeah, for sure. Well, I don't want to abuse your time, but I do want to selfishly ask you one question that I'm hoping you have the answer to. This is a behaviour debate that um, I see come yeah, up quite frequently and it's specific. Yeah, so I might have to go back to you, we'll see. <laughs> well, one of the things that I see in tweaking diets and nutrition when we're looking at working dogs, um, breeds in particular, is that um, a lot of people say that there is a high correlation between high protein diets um, and high arousal levels. What are your thoughts on that? I've heard that said many, many times. And um, I, I don't doubt that nutrients play a role in that regard. So can I point you to a study that would absolutely support it? No, I can't. But is my suspicion the same as yours? It probably is. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think it probably has uh, some impact. Um, and it may not only be uh, specific protein levels. It may be protein types, the quality of the protein, uh, how processed it is and all the rest. Um, it, you know, certainly that's going to affect the gastrointestinal uh, digestion, absorption, gut fill, uh, microbiome, um, yeah, I, I've got no doubt it has an effect, but exactly how effect and how that's um, manipulated, uh, I don't know if we have all the answers there yet. All these great answers. Hey, hey, <laughs> but the answer is yes, I think there's an effect. There you go. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, I'm really curious to play with some of that because, you know, if people are trying to reduce high arousal in animals with high anxiety, but you're trying to yeah. increase it in those working dog breeds that you really want to kick their drive into gear. So yeah. we're using diet in all sorts of ways to try to play to our yeah. own. Well, with, uh, I've got a couple of friends that are uh, neurologists and they, they play with diet now with seizures and uh, all the rest mm -hmm. as well. And, and so we know that diet modification can affect uh, seizure activity and it, for some individuals. And, and so I, I think there are genuine impacts. Um, and, you know, again, I, unfortunately in veterinary medicine, because of the, um, you know, the perceived values and the, and the money that we play with, we can't do those great big studies they do in human medicine. Um, but, you know, I think we're gonna have to obtain that information more slowly. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the future is bright in that regard. Yeah, I'm really excited well, to just I want keep to tell a little story before I go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Years ago, Yuka Nuba came out. Um, they were one of the first ones to put fish oil into their puppy diets. Yes, and, I and remember they that. Came out with a smart puppy idea, you know, the puppy learning ability was enhanced. Uh, they were quicker to learn and it was wonderful. And, you know, uh, my thought was, okay, well, we, we can get, definitely give the puppies some, some fish oil in their diets and that's a great idea, but we're going to have to give the owners some fish oil too and potentially the veterinarians and fish oil as well. You know, if, it, if it's good for them, we should probably all be taking it. <laughs> you know, Do they I, actually I do any follow-up studies on like... learning abilities with that? Sorry? Did they actually do any um, follow-up studies on, on actual learning abilities with the, I think it was the omega-3 fatty acids and the DHA that yeah. they were supplementing the diets with? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, I don't know how it played out over time, whether it made a difference in the long run, but certainly yeah. they were able to see measurable differences in, uh, in their learning ability as puppies. Hmm, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, same with children. So yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. We got to give it to the humans and the vets too. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, we all need it. We all need it. I should probably go and have some fish now. I'm feeling a bit weary. So yes, that's a great <laughs> idea. We'll get you recharged. Well, before you go eat dinner, is there anything else that you want to put out there? Any resources or information that you want to share with any of our listeners? I think we can, you and I can probably have this conversation weekly and come up with an entirely different plan and, and list of resources. Um, I think the ones you've Don't already mentioned me. Uh, are, are great. Uh, you know, I, I think we can um, probably just use those. Uh, certainly okay. within the, the ACVN website, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, different resources that get listed out from that. And similarly with the WSABA, there's a bunch of resources that will lift out from that. Uh, AFCO uh, and the NRC, if you're looking for nutrient requirements, um, that, that National Agricultural Library, if people are looking for nutrient contents of different ingredients. Um, I, th I think that's all the ones that come to my mind at the moment anyway. Okay. Yeah, I will definitely put all of those resources in the show notes below. So those are easily accessed for anybody that's listening or watching. And if you are listening to this podcast, please feel free to share it on with someone that you think would find great interest and value in learning about homemade diets and nutrition in particular. And if you're watching, please be sure to hit that like button if you like this video. Don't hesitate to drop some questions and comments below. I'll be tending to those questions as much as I possibly can. I'm not the nutri nutrition expert in this, uh, in this episode, of course, but I will defer questions if possible. If Dr. Campbell is able to answer those, I will certainly get back to those questions and comments that you post below the video. Dr. Scott Campbell, thank you so very much. This has been very informative. And I think that a lot of people listening are going to find great value in, in this as a resource and choosing kind of what the best path they feel is for in picking uh, diets for, for their own dogs and cats at home. So thank you so much. I hope they find some value and um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe in time, if we have uh, the next fad that comes along, uh, feel free to chase me again. This, this has been fun. Immediately. Yes, because I'm, I'm sure there will be another trend with these beautiful marketing departments that will have us chatting again. <laughs> Very good. All right. Thank you. Care. Thank you so much.